welcome everyone. Uh, I'm nice to nice to meet you. I'm Faustine. I'm uh, a member of the community team at Smart, uh, and I coordinate webinars. Uh, and I'm very happy to introduce you, uh, Alexa, who is here today. Uh, we are very happy to host uh, this webinar with her. With her. Um, so she's going to tell you more about user researches uh, as she is. Uh, she works as a, a product designer. Um, so I'm skipping the introduction about Malt because we don't have a, so much time to talk about that. Uh, but maybe at the end of the webinar, I'll give you some information about uh, about Malt Academies. And um, so yeah, I'm going to give uh, the the speak um, <laughs> to Alexa and um, and yeah, welcome. Uh, if you have any question during the during the uh, the talk, you can just uh, go on the question tab or chat and ask them, and uh, we'll take it uh, during the webinar. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thank <laughs> Hi, Juliet. Hi, Karina. I saw your messages in chat. Hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, sorry for the delay, um, but I'm happy to be here with you today. Um, so I will share my screen. You will confirm me that is yet. Oops. I hope you hear us well. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Okay, I hope you see my screen. Cool. Hi. So Okay, great, perfect. So like we're here together like for around uh, one hour uh, and I'm really happy like to talk about user research, especially for early and mid-stage B2B companies because it's been like uh, most of my experience so far. And I think there is a lot of challenges and a lot of great solution we can, um, we can use and we can rely on user research to find the better solutions. So, to quickly introduce myself, so I've been a designer for eight years. As you can hear, I'm French, so <laughs> I come from Paris, uh, born and raised there, uh, but I moved in Vancouver three years ago. Um, I'm passionate about cooking, hiking, uh, I also travel, um, I do also some interior design. Um, so I really try to give like a bit of um, my personality here, but I also wanted to make clear that I'm not a UX researcher by profession. So I'm a product designer, but it's methods that fascinates me. Um, I'm more here to share my experience and to experiments like I've done so far. Uh, so it's not really a theory, like a theoretical, theoretical like course. It's about what user research is, but more like like what I learned uh, in my experience and what I put in place. Um, and I'm sure like maybe some of you are you, uh, UX researchers and would be better able to explain uh, the key methodologies. So I'm, I hope that I will like inspire some creative way to use this methodology like in a different, in a different way. <clears throat> so I've worked in many B2B verticals. So I've been in advertising, an art director in advertising. Uh, I also have been like the first uh, product designer in, in retail. Um, I've been freelancer uh, in like healthcare and construction. And right now I'm a UX lead uh, in the industrial world at large. So in a company called Parsible. So we have around 40 minutes, a bit less, uh, planned for us this presentation. So, and 20 minutes for questions. But please feel free to interrupt me with like, any question you have, so you can put this in the chat. Uh, so Faustin will help me like with the questions too. Um, and, um, or just share also your experience like on the topic I'm talking about. I'm really happy also to, you know, have like some feedback about your own experience. So I will quickly recall the topics that brings us together. Um, so I will like take around like a few minutes just to uh, give a, a quick definition of what is B2B and what like I call user research. 
Uh, then I will use like the concept of mental model, which is something I really like because it explains well like why we need to know our users and how it can be super useful, especially when you create a new product or a new service, um, and how like your product can be successful just because you know your users. Um, we will also talk about like B2B versus B2C challenges and what solutions I've personally put in place. And at the end, we'll like quickly recap um, and go through questions. So quick recap, I will not spend too much time on this, but like, so when I talk about user research, I'm talking about like when like every methodology that are focusing on understanding the behaviors, the needs and the motivations of users through observation techniques, task analysis, et cetera. And I will show, like, show you a few ones I'm using. And when I talk about B2B or business to, B to business, it's really the set of commercial activities that binds two companies. So before talking about like you are like user research spe especially uh, and the heard of the matter, um, I would like us to have a consensus on why research is essential in the creation of a product or a service. So I try to rely on this concept I really like to demonstrate how much we need doing user research. So I took the definition of uh, Susan Curie um, to define this. And a mental, a mental model, in a few words, is actually represents a person's like, thought process for how something works. So it's really, at the end, like a person understanding of the surrounding world. And mental models are based on incomplete facts, past experience, is an intuitive perception. So from there, you already understand that as a result, it's almost impossible to have the same mental model that our users as a designer or a product lead or whatever stakeholders you are in the product like creation. So it's really our job to get close enough to this mental model, to the user mental model, to understand like what could like bring a solutions to user needs. And mental models also shape actions and behavior. It influences like what people pay attention to, especially in complicated solutions uh, situations, and also define how people approach and solve problems. So, if you really understand the mental model of someone, you will be able to predict how they are behaving and also how like what detail they are going to pay attention to and how like they can react in front of specific situations or scenarios. So, like if we just Take it back, like let the definition there. Like I want to give you an example to illustrate this. So, for example, Parsable is actually a startup I'm working for. It so it's simply a connected application for frontline workers that execute work in industrial companies. So when I joined Parsable like the first time, um, we they were using a lot. Uh, the term industry 4.0 to describe like how you digitize procedures and workflows. So it's really how you bring devices and technology in the industry world to make it like better, easier to use, easier to follow up, you know, easier to analyze, etc. And so the picture like here describes pretty well the vision I had at that time. Uh, so like almost three years ago about what was a factory 4.0. Like you can see like almost no human robotic arms everywhere and production problems solved in real time by you know machine learning artificial so i was really like like very far in this like vision of uh, automation and digitization but at the end like the reality was quite different so humans are well represented in today's factories they are actually the real source of value which really i understand um i understood for now and um we really try to, you know, bring the innovation while relying on people and their knowledge, expertise to improve processes like continuously. So technology plus human is actually like the perfect um, match to bring a good solution. And just to give you another example is like typically like a process today, it's not everything on computers or everything automated. It's most of the time a piece of paper where you can see like um, like who is actually uh, approving this process, what are the steps that you need to follow as an executor to perform a procedure, like you will have a 
like put a date and this kind of things. And all these papers are actually like this process is on old wooden cabinets. Uh, so as an operator, every morning you will come in the factory, take the procedure, know exactly what you have to do by following the steps there. So finally, between my mental model, my expectation of what a factory 0.40 should be, and the ones that share frontline workers using paper every day uh, at the beginning of the shift, you can see that possible, like the application comes in the middle to find the right balance between user mental model and habits and innovation or dis disruption. So really, like, if you're working on something that is really new, you have to take into account like the user mental model. And so they are not too overwhelmed by user change, but they still acknowledge the value um, of the product you're bringing. Um, and it's mainly uh, relying on the mental model. So if you want to represent that, we have kind of two worlds. So on the left, it's you the designer, the product lead, you know, the marketing chief, like the stakeholder that is going to work on this product. And on the right, you have the user. So it's like the customer, the buyer, the end user, the person who is going to use your product. And so these two worlds can be quite different. Uh, so when you're building something, it's really important to have something shared. So how you can do that is relying on user research methodologies to reduce the gap and have a bigger shared mental model. So more you can learn about your user, more you will get closer to user mental model. And we can assume that when you show this, like this part is like the product is going to be more useful and adequate to what the user needs. So I hope that it makes like sense to you. Um, and like really what we have to remember is like with this like story with mental models and users, like the important thing is like if you rely on like something that people know, it will be easier to understand, to use, and to learn. Do we have a question? I just heard like the and um, nope, for now okay. there is no question. <laughs> I just hear the noise of the notification. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, Cool. So I hope like it's useful, like and understandable so far. <laughs> so key points to make a product like a product successful is making it understandable, usable, easy to use, and easy to learn. So like get closer to the user is really a good way to do it. So now we finally get into the herd of the matter. So what are the user research methods that allow us to reduce this gap and get closer to what people think and how they behave? And so I know there is a lot of challenges in B2B. Um, and this is what I, I will show you, like what are the challenges and what kind of solutions you can put in place to tackle these challenges. So the first one is at the difference of B2C, those who buy, so the buyers, are most of the time different from those we use, the end user. So I will give you examples like uh, we are not talking about like you know Instagram, Facebook, WhatsApp, for example, um, and like the people who are going to use Instagram, maybe you, is going to be the person who is going to buy uh, like Instagram ads, for example, if you need to. Um, but like for Salesforce, for example, which is like a, a software for sales processes. Um, the people who are buying are really different from the person who is going to use it. Like, or like for possible, for example, like the like the operator, the person who is on the product line, like doing things, is not the person who is going to buy, right? So, most of the time they are different, and this is really the biggest uh, challenge. Like as a product lead, like you will face, and the best thing to do it's pretty obvious is like identify the end user and its needs. So like a good methodology is obviously user interviews. So how you can talk to the end user and also recruit, recruit them because I know how it can seem hard to recruit like when you're in B2B sometimes. So I put like some tips like and processes in place to help with recruitment. So the first thing you can do is bounce back on customer requests. For, for example, new functionalities uh, that like the sales of the support like uh, can bring um, and talk about. So 
for example, you can go back to your customer and say, hey, you told us about you need to do that, and we want to create a new functionality in collaboration with you and not for you. So you're not building something for them. You're building something in collaboration with them. So they will feel really understood, listened, and this is really the best way to actually like talk to the people who are going to buy and then use um, what happens most of the time is like you will talk to like let's say uh, the executive or like the buyer and then you will see um, you will say oh yeah I really need to talk to the person who are using the app on the floor for example for possible and and they will give you the contacts to talk to these people uh, especially if like they feel understood and listened um, then like if you like once you take like all the customer requests you can also like tell them that they will have early access in the direct line with our like the product team it's something that really they appreciate most of the time like buyers and like, customers really they don't often have like a direct line with the product team so when they do have these opportunities they really give as many feedback as they can because they want that the product is really answering to the need. So they will really take this opportunity as a as a good thing. And this is also how you can um, recruit and make sure that people answer to your questions. Um, something else you can do also is like create a pool of beta testers and create a special relationship with them. So because in B2B sometimes you don't have like um, millions of users um, or like especially in early stage or mid stage for a startup, um, what you can do is like really trying to rely on like a, like a really a small pool and you will have a real connection with them so you can send them a message, you know how they are using product, you know what kind of feature they can be interested in. And so like you have this direct relationship with them so you can also like you know, brainstorm, you could also show maybe early uh, prototypes or IDs and not like the final product and really giving like um, more gathering feedback like early. And a last thing I really liked uh, during like the onboarding we did like at Parsible, for example, is having a buddy. So you could potentially like, um, like when as a designer I started at Parsible, like um, I was, um, attached to a sale so like we were like my buddy was from the customer success department actually and like it was like it was like she was like very dedicated to one industry uh, so agriculture for example um, and so I became also the specialist of this industry and I became the voice of this industry in my design team and why it's important is because like for example like another designer was more um close to like another industry and the these two industries were very different and they had different challenges so sometimes we debate about the value of a feature for me it was not inter like interesting for example and for them it was so um it's also a good way to really know well industry and like create debates within your design team and making sure that it's valuable like a feature or a product is valuable for your entire uh customer base Also, like to recruit, um, who better to recruit than your colleagues in the field? So I'm talking to, I'm talking about sales, customer success, consultants. Like they are, they are. These people are talking to your clients on a daily basis, and who are most likely to find the right profiles. So what I did, like it's an example here. Here is I share an agenda one week in advance by email, saying like I'm working on this. Uh, this is like the topics I want to to touch base. Uh, this is the goal of my user interview. Um, so I'm looking for this kind of profile. Who do you think I should talk to? And it's really a good way to identify the best people to talk to just by sending this to all your um, sales CS team uh, to get like really good profiles to uh, to identify and. The last thing also is, I don't know if it happens to you, but it happens to me a lot, is most of the time, like sales, CS, et cetera, they hesitate to send product team or product leads to unhappy customers. Uh, most of the time we talk to really happy customers, people who like us, but I think that also there is a lot of value talking to the one who are not happy and we will tell you 
why they're frustrated. So it also helps the team sometimes unblock 10 situations because like when a customer is disappointed with an existing or a missing feature, like just coming to them and listen and just showing like how we care, how their feedback is important is a great opportunity to understand like why they're frustrated and showing like that they are valuable for us. So it's also avoid some time a churn. Um, I'm not saying that everything will will be like done like in a one hour meeting, but it's sometimes just unblock like situation just by listening and we can also identify like specific like issues that we may be solve. Um, that happens to me also like I give tips that the person like the end user didn't know and it was more um, workaround than a real feature like or real solutions, but it helps like um, this customer wait until we find the right solution and it didn't turn. So I think it's it's a good example how like also the product team can can help. And so carrying out like user interviews without first defining your audience can be very disappointed. So it's also, I'm sharing that also, maybe you know that already, but um, it happens to me one time that for me it was natural that I wanted to talk to the end user, but I didn't precise it uh, in my user guide. So I faced like an executive teams where I learned a lot, but not really enough on the need I was working on. So it's really important that you say the target you have in mind so it can be ethnological criteria, it can be social or physical criteria. Like you can see, like for example, here it's like more physical or physiological. Uh, when I was working on a healthcare product, so those are very statistical. But it can also be like according like the usage uh, of a feature or like if someone requested it. So in this example, it was like an analytics feature. So uh, you can see I tried to choose like different verticals to make sure that it could apply to every like customer type. Um, and also what I did is I talked to what I call the NT persona. So it's actually the person who never requests the, the feature. So for example, like we had, we had like a customer, we had a lot of customers who asked about analytics in our product, but we also had like one or two who never asked anything about it. And we were very surprised that they were not interested in this um, in this feature. So um, I really try to um, to like really understand why and I talk to them and I say, okay, I really want to talk to the people who never asked for it. And what I learned is actually they already had like, they didn't have the like, very happy with, but they had like something in place for the data pool, like where they gather all the data. And so I discovered that actually what they need is more an integration with our like database instead of just like a feature to create dashboard and charts, for example. So I also added like these requirements to like with the PM um, to really like also fit this need that we totally missed. So talking to people will never ask is a good thing. Um, you have a, a question, so I'm sorry to interrupt. No uh, from um, Brian who asks, um, how do you manage uh, user interviews in COVID time? Yeah, that's a really good point too. Uh, it definitely had a good, like a, a real impact on how many times we can talk to them. Um, I would say that for some of them, it creates a lot of opportunities uh, because they had more time because like sometimes they were trying to, you know, they, they, they were not working 100% of the time. So they actually had like more time to discuss with us and some of them was to the contrary. So I would say that I will show you some tools you can use to do like um, interviews by, for example, Zoom, uh, you can, like most of the time what I did because I'm working with customers around the world is most of the time it's by Zoom anyway. So doing like your interviews um, in videos uh, with your team shadowing behind is also a good thing. Um, and last thing also is like using more often like surveys. So it's more once you actually talk to a few people um, and you recruit maybe less than usual, what you can do is um, 
once you understand like the key needs, like validating this by like quantitative surveys that you can send to more people, like to all your user base that have the profile you're looking for. So you talk to less people, but at the end you maybe validate this with more people with a survey and more precise questions. I hope that it helps. So, and he asked another question. <laughs> so he asks, uh, and what kind of reward do you uh, give to people you interview? Or how do you motivate them to spend uh, 45 minutes with you in a Zoom meeting? Yeah, good question too. Uh, so it really depends uh, where you work. So for example, at Parsable, I never give anything because like most of the time there is like kind of, um, project leads and it's really um, innovation departments who are working with like the tool like possible so it's also important for them to implement this kind of tools uh, but I also had like for example for healthcare what we did is we gave away like Amazon gifts or if you're working with like uh, again in healthcare we had like products devices like balances watches this kind of things um, for well-being, like we actually like give this product for free. So it's like, I would say Amazon gift right now is, is just way to do it because it's like instant, like you can instantly send it instead of sending everything by pass. But like, um, yeah, both can work actually. Like sometimes they are okay to also give like their time for free. Um, if they feel that the feature is going to come out or if they feel like it's a need that nobody cared about so far. Um, so, um, for recruitment, also another thing that I used only once, to be honest, because most of the time we have very, um, difficult profiles that are not in like usual user base, like survey monkey audience. Um, but like it works for healthcare again, like um, when a problem affects a large number of people, you can rely on this kind of tools that are very efficient, um, sometimes a bit expensive, but it's worth the expense from according to me. Um, so it's really a tool when you can define like uh, who you're targeting. Yeah, like I put like very like simple criteria here, but you have very, very precise criteria in this tool, for example, and you can go very deep in the user profile. So I would like uh, maybe give a chance to this kind of tool. You can look at it online and uh, try it out for, f I think there is like a free trial. Um, you have two other questions if you, uh, if you can, uh, yeah. if you want to answer now. So Leah is asking, mm -hmm. uh, how do you convince a company to take the lead in UX design and research uh, when they not? Um, yeah, that's very hard, especially when you're the first one. Um, I've been the first like product designer bringing like user research um, in a retail company, and um, I would say that start small. I would I would say that you should start small. So by this I mean like for example like start with like the data. For example, if they have like if they have some data about the usage of a feature or something that is already existing, uh, you can say okay, like you can see like here there is a drop off of like thirty percent on like the sign in flow. Like people are not signing up like most of the time after X steps of signing up um, and bringing this always to the business. So. Not saying like, oh, I, I need to talk to people to better understand their needs. Yeah, that's true. But it's better to say, I think there is an issue in adoption here. So it certainly reduced the business of X. And I want to validate that um, with like some talking, like by talking to, to users or customers to see if we could reduce this gap, which would bring more business. Um, I think that's also like adapting how you talk about user research according to the audience. So if you're talking about with designers, it's okay, but if you're talking to executives or your CPO or your head of products, it's really relying on usage, adoption, 
how you can like, acquisition, how you can make sure that there is more people coming to your site, to your product and trying out. Um, or if it's B2B and you don't have trial, like just identify, like I said, like paths where you have a lot of churn uh, or like a, a lot of drop off of the key, like flows that you think and you know that is going to bring more usage. Um, and then after when you, yeah, sorry, like I was like, I hope that it helps. Like, I think that after you have your first like successes, like going bigger and bigger, like doing more user research and more like, you know, broader research, less precise, and people will understand that there is like a real value behind that. And there is also a, a question of um, Ali. Alejandro, uh, he's asking, how do you cross-reference usage data with user survey uh, and to try to and figure out what users really want? So. Good one. Um, so yeah, user surveys. So it's really data, I suppose. Um, so I think that. How could I say that? Like, data is good. Data is very important, but it should not be um, the thing that's going to help you decide. Um, like, if you do only like usage data and quantitative survey, you may bias your survey and miss an opportunity. So I think it's always important to at least talk to, even if you not, you cannot talk to five or ten people uh, in user interviews. So in more like you know open-ended questions at least try to talk to, like even one is better than zero, right? So try to talk to at least like three, four, five uh, user and um, then you can really build a survey based on like common answers and validate that. Because if you go with usage, da usage data and surveys that will always be biased on your assumptions, you may go in a direction that, um, maybe not entirely the right one. So you can like half answer to a, to a problem. Like I'm trying to like, if I'm trying to think about analytics, for example, like the first assumption we had was like everyone had BI analysts, like every ha everybody had data scientists in their company because it was really big companies. And if you look at data, yes, it, we could have, we could have this conclusion because like usage data was showing there is a lot of usage and interest in the dashboards. And in the same time, like people were asking for analytics, so we could have, we could have said we just need an API and making sure that everything works for these data scientists. But at the end, when we talked to people, we just realized that nobody really had this kind of department, and it was relying on people who also had another job, like there was like a sheet manager, or they were so they were just trying to create that on their own uh, on their spare time. Um, and that's not something we could have understood in the user data or even validate with a survey. Um, so yeah, I hope that it works. It makes sense. <laughs> may I, okay, may, I see there is a lot of questions. Yeah, I can, I can continue and take a, a few other questions after. Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, but I, I found this question very interesting. Um, so another thing that also I uh, try to do, maybe can also answer to a, a few questions I saw, is like listing really the topics that where you need information to better target the questions um, is really key to a good uh, interview guide. So sometimes you know you list your list questions for your user guide you know that um, you have to talk about these topics but if you don't clearly put your hypothesis and make sure that you have questions for every hypothesis you had um, you may miss like to validate one so for example like here what you can see as was like a survey for healthcare and we understood like with like a few um, with some data and feedback that for example like if you look at the row three um, so it was like be healthy is a motivation before money. So like because like when you are very healthy, you will say no, I don't want to put too much money in my healthcare insurance, for example. But when you are sick, you 
totally change your mind and people would tend to put way more money so it's something we discovered and we wanted to validate that with like the users of our application so um, i put like this hypothesis and making sure that i have at least one or two questions to like validate or not this hypothesis um something also like that i try to say more and more and more is like the information you you are going to gather from these interviews are not going to be useful until it's understood acquired and shared with and by the product team or the people who are going to work on the product so if you have like the real truth like if you exactly know what to do but nobody um participate to any user interviews and nobody really look at your report because it's super detailed and it's like 32 pages um you will have hard time to um really convince uh, what the best solution is and so what i try to do for example is summarize in a few words really the most important needs in a fun and easy way to ingest so also something i i encourage you to do is like invite like one engineer like making sure the PM is always there during user interviews um, making sure that people want to participate or listen to this user interviews are there they don't have to say anything they should not even because you are the person who are guiding like this interview is unbiased questions but they could just shadow the user interview and really listen to what the people have to say because uh, it's always better um, and you don't have to convince someone who already hear it right by themselves. And so even if like this exercise that I put you in example, like the press release, it's something you can do in a group. So if everyone participates to the user interview, you can do like this exercise of the press release. What would be the ideal press release if you want to communicate when a feature will be out? So it's an example, I, uh, it's a real example also for another project. And I put really the five things that I wanted to tell to our customers when the, the thing will be out. And it's also a good way to align your team on the key things you need to accomplish. Um, and finally, it's also something interesting to come back to when you implemented like a few weeks or if it's a really big thing, a few months. Um, um when you released it like it's a good thing to come back to it and say if what you envision has been implemented um i will not spend too much time on this slide uh persona everybody heard about persona i think it's like how you can in a page summarize um visually or not um with some data like what are the typology of people or you are designing for it uh, there is a lot of debate around usefulness of persona. Um, what I can tell you is what we use is what we call proto-persona. So it's only persona that are defined for a specific capability or a specific feature. We don't have like persona for the entire product. We just create some for when we're working on something specific. So here is an example for analytics. Um, what I put as a real photos, real people, uh, a user journey map that I was like based sometimes on assumptions that you are going to, you know, improve. And even sometimes you can show this to the customer if you really have a good relationship with him or her. And you can you can say, hey, like, is that your real life? Like, um, especially with open question like, uh, oh, tell me about your typical day. And this is how you can build like this kind of journey, uh, user journey you can see on the top of the paper. Um, and really like based on what you know about what device they are using and things like that. So try to avoid like using like what we saw often in templates online, which is like ethnological statistics, like uh, children divorced, um, except if it's very useful for your product. Uh, try to really find the right amount of data and the valuable one for your product. Um, challenge two, um, so we spend a lot of the challenge one, which is for me the most important, but there is also other challenge, like those who buy, so the buyers are not the end user, but most of the time it's either one person, most of the time it's a committee. So it's committee, like uh, executive committee, or it's going to be the CTO, the CFO, and the C-level. 
um, or the executives of um, a company. So there is really, most of the time, different needs, different expectation of the, pro of the product you are creating. And it creates a lot of challenges. Um, and so the decision, but the decision of the buyer like can greatly influence the user experience and understand the business reasons of why someone is going to buy your product is important. Um, I would almost say as important as understanding your end user because like sometimes if you if you really find the best thing to do to solve an issue if you don't convince like the people on the top to buy your product it can be harder uh sometimes there is like bottom up um influence that can help you but it's always also like good to know like what the buyers are looking for so um, like it's also a way to really succeeding in prioritizing the right next development or improvement uh, to make sure that it's your product is adopted. So like just the image like you can see here is like something I really appreciate doing uh, with like the CPO. Uh, it was like having like um, like some customers, executives and buyers um, bring them together in one location. Here was Sonoma for like one or two days and doing kind of like a committee event where you can uh, ask questions uh, without asking them like what are the strategy because sometimes there is even competitors and the funny thing i was actually concerned to bring like customers that could be competitors in their field but actually they really appreciate being together and share like best practices without obviously sharing like really key things on their strategy, but just sharing like what they do, what they're facing, uh, is there like innovation or things we all should we there sh they should look at uh, in the future to go in place. And so we have like this like stakeholders discuss about like the great way to bring up like key issues um, and ensure that us our as a product uh, team, we are listening to all this feedback and like take a lot of ideas we could never had, like if, if we didn't create this kind of event. And that was funny because we didn't do a lot. They were actually like talking a lot together and you're just here to listen. We also obviously like uh, organize like exercises. So for example, like we had this exercise where you give like fake uh, $100 for everyone. And we created like the key thing we were thinking for our roadmap and say to our customers, hey, where would you would you bet, right? Or where would you put your money? Um, and so we actually discovered that they wanted like a specific innovation and they all agree on that this innovation was the key for the future. And so we build partnership and pilot project around that. So it's a great way also to find partners uh, among your customers to try like new things where you are not sure about the business value and they are not sure either, but they want to try out. Uh, third like, challenge is most of the time you, you certainly hear that like this phrase, this sentence, like we always hear to justify the lack of usability and desirability of a product. It's, it's a tool for pros. So it's not too important that it's like super good experience. It's not too important that uh, they really appreciate like using the product. Um, I definitely think and know that it's not true, um, especially because like, um, like they are using like people in, the, in general are using product in their personal life like Instagram, Facebook, and they are used to these really good apps or they are really used to like easy navigation, easy like experience, some motions to help you understand how it works. And so if you have something really crappy, uh, even, if, even if it's the best like uh, way to solve an issue they have, they will be disappointed. And so I'm going to like some tools that uh, can help you justify the strengths of good design. So the first thing is very simply like prove the importance of desirability as a competitive advantage through system usability score. So it's something most of the time you can add a widget to your product um, and ask people here it's on one dread, but you could also like on one to 10, like how easy is it to use this product or maybe sometimes you can also focus on a specific feature you launched for example how easy is it to use to use this uh this feature 
And so if the score is very low, it will create concerns um, in sales department or CS department because like someone who is not happy with how it's that is easy to use or how like it will it will like uh, break um, the adoption right um, it will hide the ad the adoption and people will not really use as much as it should. Um, and less usage there is, less opportunity to expand as a sale, the contract, and so it can have like a lot of impact on the business. <clears throat> uh, really, something that I really liked and it was really useful the last years for me and our team, um, it's actually, you certainly heard about the heuristic evaluation maybe, um, that's something that uh, the NN Group, so Nielsen, um, a famous like, um, UX designer, he almost found like founded the UX like uh, expertise. Uh, he defined like ten heuristics, so it's kind of criteria to identify the problems and formulate like in really like compliant, non-compliant criteria. And so you can see like in this example, you have like four key topics that the functional that like the behavioral the behavioral that that the documentation that and so you have like sub items here and so for example for the first one like information architecture if your navigation is not good if people cannot find what they are looking for right away it can be a functional debt and so listing all of these things that sometimes you have hard time to convince like other people that it's important um, is a good way already to log everything you see in your product so what I can show you here is like, I will show you there here. Some examples is you can have really small things like the, the, like the second arrow, like it's multiple help treatments. So you have in your product different way to give help. Sometimes it's a question mark. Sometimes it's like a tool tip sometimes. Like, and so maybe it can be inconsistent. And so people don't find the help they need because they are not used of these 10 thing, ways of doing it when you are designing it in your product. But you have more important ones, like for example, the first, the first one is tab usage for mandatory steps. So we use like, for example, tabs, whereas normally it was not optional information. You had to go through every step to complete something. Uh, that's way more important, but it's hard to, as a designer, to say to the product team, hey, uh, I want to redesign this entire page because it's using tabs instead of cards, for example. Um, and so what you can do is by logging all this like debt you accumulated over time, uh, you can find sometimes like common things on a similar page and say one day, well, you see we accumulated all these debt and the problem is X, Y, Z because you identify like, like like maybe you can go in user usage data and see there is issue on this page that you couldn't really understand before you did this like analysis um or maybe sometimes development wants to refactor a component like the table and you already logged in all the issues you found in common tables in your product and you say oh we really need to be able to sort every columns um, because X, Y, Z, because sometimes we can in this tab and in this one we cannot, so we have to to make sure there is a common component. So yeah, this tool is really great, and you can also prioritize it by like how you think it is severe, like how like important is it, and how frequent you can see it in the product. So sometimes it's not, it's minor severity, but sometimes you can see it everywhere. So the priority will be bigger because it will have a bigger impact if you change this. Um, last thing, I think it, we touched also a bit about the question about COVID and how you can talk to people or contact people is like using usability testing, uh, but uh, unmoderated. So instead of being there with the people, um, to conduct the usability test and testing a prototype, testing an ID, testing a concept. Um, you can also like use tools to just put your prototype on a website and people have the task and they can do it like by themselves. I will show you an example after. Um, 
So most of the time, it's good to have pre-test questions, especially about, for example, if you, when I was working on analytics, I asked questions about their expertise regarding analytics. Some of them were not tech savvy and never use any analytics tool, whereas some others really used to Power BI, for example. So I try also to balance like the tests and results that um, according their expertise. And also what I try to do is every time I ask for a specific task, uh, so using like the term you use in your product, in your prototype. So if, for example, if you say, um, how could you find like a chart instead of saying chart because it's in your prototype. So people could just say chart, like it would be more, how would you build, like how would you, um, how would you, find uh, if like your team is doing well through data uh, and so see if they would have the reflex to create a dashboard or a chart or something like that. And you can see at the end of the page, you are also asked a question around the, if it's easy to do, if the task is easy to perform on one to five. And this allow me to actually like create this kind of um, map, like experience map and see like for every task, like on one to five, how easy it was. I can clearly identify visually identify where the gaps are. Um, I took like these two examples because I think it's a great example of um, what you can expect and what you don't want to expect. So you can see the yellow one, it could be a good experience uh, because it's average around like three and four and even goes to five sometimes, whereas like the first um, experience map uh, in blue, you can see there is a lot of five and a lot of one. And the issue with that is what a human is going to remember is like the variance, the differences. So it's better to have a strong three. So the experience is pretty flat. It's going, uh, it's not amazing, but it's not bad either. And there is no too many variants the people will like the experience and say it's a good experience. Whereas if they have like really good experiences and really bad experiences and change their emotion that way, the flow or the happy path, uh, they will use to say that it's a bad experience. Even if they reach like maybe like here, you can see one, two, three, four, five, five times they reach like five, it's excellent. They will say it's a bad experience because they also touched like the one and had a lot of variance during the experience. Um, um, so yeah. next time maybe we'll uh, yeah. finish soon. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it depends if you if you want to say some few things or, or answer the question when now it depends on what you want to do. But we'll. Have no, I think that that's good. I think I can just like recap. Um, so in short, like I think that remember that Zeus will buy or not with Zeus we use. So you can use like user interviews, proto persona to make sure that you are designing not for the buyers, but for the people who are going to use it. Um, the buyers are different, like are often a committee. So it's important also to understand like um, what are the expectations or um, what are the executive vision um, for you for the company you're working for and for the customers you're working for so you can innovate uh, and also like like you see like uh, if we tell you that it's a tool for pros well like um, people also have like a life and they they are using like tools in the daily life that are very good so they have the same expectation in the professional and personal life and finally like the one I didn't touch but it was really quick it was like the competition is the same they don't do better. So I think the competitive analysis is a good way to show that even if competition is not apparently doing better, maybe they have better uh, features or they're touching opportunity the product didn't touch. So analyze, um, doing an analyze here is good. And a last thing I want to say to conclude is like, most of the time you will say that to sell, you need to do more features, to do new features. But like at the end, like sometimes improving exist the existing product is better than creating new things because like you want to make it very simple and to go deep in the problem. And 
it, it's better to bring value on existing um, that will be very faster uh, than going to like the usual like stage of a future life cycle, like from pilot to pre-release to release. It's going to take maybe six to one year, six months to one year. So sometimes improving something will bring value right away and increase like your adoption and, and the number of users. So I couldn't touch base everything, but I hope you liked it. And don't forget that all these methodologies are tools. So just uh, make them like you own. Uh, try new things. Take like ideas here and there, and create your own processes. And you will be uh, you will have a superpower. Thank you. Um, so maybe you want to answer quickly questions, or mm -hmm. what do you want to do? Yes. Sure. So we have a question uh, from Anthony who says, uh, how many interviews should be conducted per month to get enough information to complement the data? I can't really answer this question. I think that's really depending on the product and the kind of users you have and the problems you're facing. Um, yeah, I couldn't give you like a number per month. Uh, it depends also of how many designers you are. Like, I think it's good also to be realistic about uh, your resources and the budget you have. Um, I would say that it's better to do less, but well, than too many and too fast and missing like things just because you want to talk to too many people. Um, yeah. Um, so another question from Kenda. Um, don't you think POC might help uh, a lot, meaning develop and push and test the market to evaluate what they really want. Have you tried this method and do you recommend it? Oh yeah, of course. So I couldn't touch base, like it was part of the last slides, but yeah, I, we always do POC. Um, uh, so the feature life cycle goes always from pilot. So we try something new. Um, then in pre-release, so we release this to like a few beta testers. Uh, we gather like some feedback. Um, we go like we talk to them. We make sure that um, we improve this. And then when we improved it, it goes in release uh, for everyone, uh, for all our customers. Um, and also most of the features we're developing are behind flags. So. Um, it's also like according like the sales or the customer success, who is going to talk to the customer and decide if this feature is useful for, for them and uh, switch on the feature. Um, so yeah, a lot of things you can do. And I dev obviously like recommend POC. I think it's mandatory to always like um, try this with some people before like releasing to everyone and improve it like in like short cycles. And the last question of uh, Kinda: What is it you use for story mapping and personal? It looks very interesting. Uh, I did it like myself, so I create templates uh, on Sketch. On Sketch, um, uh, but we use also Abstract uh, um, to actually like communicate with like everyone, so people can comment uh, on the personas and discuss about it. So. And you can like developers can also inspect uh, when you have like mockups. So very interesting tool. Um, yeah, stem for story mapping. I know there is a lot of tools uh, outside. Uh, I will share my um, my slides. Also, I put like a, a few tools I couldn't go through um, during this presentation. But the card sorting, Otimo sort is a good one. Look back is amazing for unmoderated usability testing and user research. Um, yeah, this is the one I'm thinking of. There is many tools outside. Yeah, you can try, and most of them are free trials. So. OK, so thank you very much. You answered all the questions. Uh, <laughs> so thank you, everybody, for attending. And of course, Alexa, for hosting uh, this webinar. It was really interesting and really complete. So thanks. And um, also, if you want, uh, all of you, uh, you can check other webinars on our uh, website, so multacademy.com. So it's here. Um, on the chat, I'll put it the link. And um, 
And so um, if you want also to become a, a speaker like Alexa yourself uh, and host a Malt Academy, you can, you can send us um, uh, your topic by clicking on the, the button, uh, become a speaker on the website. Uh, so thank you very much, Alexa. <laughs> thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Yeah. Bye.